Well, uh, is, is it unethical to peddle automobiles that uh, kill 50,000 people and kill more people than all of the uh, wars put together? Uh, liquor kills a lot of people. Alcoholism is much more rampant than lung cancer, has uh, led to more domestic violence than uh, lung cancer, uh, than cigarettes have. And we tried to ban it in the 20s, and it failed miserably. We know we, if we have a sense of what's right and wrong, we have to rely on our, often our own self-discipline uh, to not be excessive. And yes, we know cigarettes can cause a lot of bad things, but that means that uh, if the government prohibits it, I guarantee it's going to make bring the mystique back to it. It, it, it doesn't work. That kind of top-down morality doesn't work. It's much more effective when, if you light up a cigarette and people look at you askance, it's much more effective than a government decree. So uh, let, 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 let it play out like that. And I think, uh, you know, you, you, you get a better result than Kessler trying to treat it like a prescription drug. It, it won't work. And for some reason, human nature being what it is, people sometimes like to do things that uh, may not be good for their health. Uh, if that goes back 4,000 years. And, uh, and then, then sometimes, like with wine now or beer, I forget which, my brother, one of my brothers likes beer, and he pointed out an article that claimed that it was good for, if you had a beer or once in a while, it was good for your blood flow or something. I don't know. But uh, uh, morality's got to come from below, not dictated from above. Sir, what do you think of Mr. Waxman's very rude treatment of the tobacco executives? After all, he's a successful businessman, more successful than he is as a politician. Well, uh, Henry Waxman, I, I shouldn't be insulting uh, members of Congress with, uh, since Senator Helms has to live with some of these people, but uh, he, he's, I don't agree with him on most issues, and uh, I sometimes think that uh, the morality of some of these people is very selective. If he could get as up in arms about some of the other things that happen in our society, like in our streets and with our drug dealers, if he could get as much umbrage up about some of the other things wrong with our society, I could uh, at least say, well, at least the man is consistent. But like so many of us, he, he's not. So I'm, I'm not a Henry fan. Mr. Forbes, I represent the American Printer Magazine and Graphic Communications World, two publications of interest in the printing and publishing uh, industry. As such, we have an interest in your uh, comment on the information highway and the survival of print, and very particularly, uh, with that information highway, the activity that is now going on in Washington to build uh, privacy problems into the information highway, the uh, clipper chip, the backdoor encryption devices for FBI surveillance. I wonder if you might comment on some of those issues, and perhaps uh, Senator Helms might uh, comment on some of those from a political standpoint. Well, on the information highway, the wrong way to think of it is thinking of it as concrete in the air. Uh, which Albert Gore used to think of, I don't know if he still does. There, it's not one highway, it is zillions of highways, almost, it's, and they're being created not through the government, but by individuals. Almost 70% of the PCs now are connected to some local area network, CompuServe or some other. So it's happening already, and it's being done by millions of individuals. Uh, clipper chip, I think, is wrong, uh, because the only ones who, who will use it are the honest people, and if you're a terrorist, you're not going to use a machine with a clipper chip, period. Uh, so, so these devices are, are going to hurt our sales, they're going to hurt our industry, and they're not going to fight what they are allegedly supposed to fight. As for the printed page, I think the printed page will survive, uh, just as magazines survive with the advent of radio and television, but it's simply going to be more ways of passing on information. Uh, for example, Bill Gates, we spent a week, one of our editors for our technology supplement, ASAP, spent a week with Bill Gates. Bill Gates reads a lot of printed paper each day, even though he's the head of Microsoft. However, he does not use the telephone. He uses electronic mail, and every evening, after the end of a busy day, he answers 
electronically 200 messages a day. So he uses the printed page, he uses electronics, and I think that's that kind of uh, melding you're going to continue to see exist. People are not going to sacrifice one for the other. Apropos of that, I do have to recall that 12 years ago, when the advent of the PC, personal computer, people said, gee, that will lead to a paperless office. Now, PCs are essential to offices, but I haven't noticed any less paper with the advent of the computer than I did before the computer. So it'll, there'll be coexistence, as they used to say. Senator? Oh. Okay. Well, in healthcare, I think healthcare ought to be available to individuals and that healthcare dollars ought to be controlled by individuals on, on whom they're spent. Right now, uh, in this country, if you want to buy a health insurance policy, you have to do it as an individual with after-tax dollars whereas an employer gets to buy it with pre-tax dollars. I think individuals ought to have the same tax treatment as corporations. I think individuals ought to be able to set up, if they so wish, a medical version of an IRA, where either they can put in money or a company can put in money. And if you don't use it, you don't lose it. It's there at the end of the year if you don't use it. Right now, some of these so-called menu plans, flexibility plans, if there's where you can put the money in a certain amount of insurance and other fringe benefits, if you don't use it by the end of the year, you lose it, which is crazy. There's no incentive to spend your dollars carefully. So equal tax treatment, and then you should take care of the flaws in our current system. One is portability. If you lose your job, you should have the unconditional right to carry, if the employer offers insurance, the unconditional right to carry that policy with you so you don't go four, six months, or eight months without insurance. There ought to be high-risk pools for those who have pre-existing conditions uh, having certain parameters so you can get it. If you are too poor to buy insurance, there ought to be vouchers or something or tax credits or something so that you can buy basic insurance. The key, two key things you want to avoid are mandated employer insurance because that will destroy small businesses and destroy jobs. That's what's happened in Europe. And you want to avoid government-mandated universal coverage because if it comes from the government mandating it, the government will tell you what has to be in an insurance policy. That should be up to an individual. If you don't wish to pay for a chiropractic pract uh, a chiropractor, that should be your choice. However, if uh, chiropractors get together and lobby Washington, that may be made mandatory in insurance. So let individuals tailor policies to their own needs, for whatever their needs are at that specific point in their life. And so ethically, I would like to rely on individuals rather than government bureaucracies. In Europe, they do government bureaucracies. In Canada, they do. And the results are not very good. Uh, especially for diseases that require very sophisticated and expensive treatment. In England, for example, talking about ethics, if you need kidney dialysis and you're past the age of 60, in England you stay at the end of the line. They're going to let you die. That's a conscious policy decision. And I don't think we should have that kind of rationing in this country. And uh, just to close on that question, at Forbes like three years ago, when we were faced with rising costs like everyone else, we noticed that with insurance policies, as they were then done and still done today, is that it's all stick and no carrot. When a company needs to control costs, they often raise the copay, they often raise the deductible, but there's no reward for individuals or no capacity for individuals to control their health care spending. And so we put in a bonus system. We noticed that the system was being clogged by small claims and so in effect we offered a bonus system offering paying our people not to file small claims we offered them to pay them the difference between what they filed in claims at five hundred dollars now it's six hundred and fifty we've liberalized it and then double it in other words if you filed no claims in nineteen ninety two 
you get $500 times two or $1,000 tax free. We gross it up and pay the tax. Last year it was 1,200, this year it's uh, 1,300. Suddenly people realize that every time they file the dollar of claims, was two dollars out of their own pocket. They suddenly realized this was really their own money and that it paid to take care of themselves, that there was something in it for them. And so suddenly people started to do with their health care dollars what they do with every other market. If they got a prescription, they'd take it to more than one drugstore because drugstores do charge different prices for prescriptions. They began to question their doctors in a way they never would before if they thought somebody else was paying for it. And the way to look at the crazy way we do health insurance in this country right now is ask yourself what would happen to food costs if every time you went to the supermarket or the grocery store or wherever you got food, the vending machine, and took those receipts and turned them in for reimbursement from the insurance company. You wouldn't care what your bottle of Coca-Cola costs or whatever it is you drink or eat if you thought somebody else was paying for it, so food costs would go through the roof. We'd have a food care crisis in this country instead of a health care crisis. So empower individuals. The ethical way to go is give individuals the power to control those dollars. That way you have 100 million people policing the health market instead of insurers, bureaucrats, and employers, and we would get the best of all worlds. We can get universal coverage through individual choice, not government mandate. We get continued advances in research and development. Most of the patents come out of this country. They don't come from socialized medical countries. And uh, we can be a model for the rest of the world as well as uh, taking care of ourselves a little better. Let's let somebody who knows what he's talking about get up here. <laughs> By that standard, you would stay in that podium. Well, howdy, folks. Um, what, do, what do you think uh, the chance of Mr. Clinton's re-election? <laughs> well, I don't know whether I, it would be my heart or my head talking. Uh, frankly, I feel sort of like that bumper sticker that I saw the other day. Is it 1996 yet? <laughs> but uh, frankly, I'd like to see uh, another president. And I think probably at this point, at least, the majority of the American people would. Let me say a word or two about uh, Richard Nixon. The last word I've had today, and I, I've checked with the office, and uh, it's about the same as it was last night when we got a report in the Senate. The Senate was in session quite late last night, and the apprehension was last night that Mr. Nixon would not survived the night. So he's a fighter. Now he's comatose and uh, he doesn't know about all the situation. But instinctively he's always been a fighter and uh, he for a long time has been a friend of mine and I've been a friend of his. Dating back to the late uh, uh, 1951 when I was administrative assistant to Senator Willis Smith of North Carolina. And uh, Mr. Nixon was a senator from California. Mr. Nixon's office was between the other senator from North Carolina, Senator Cloud R. Hoy, then it was Mr. Nixon's office, and then it was Mr. Smith's office. And Mr. Smith was chairman of the board of trustees of Duke University at the time. And as you know, Mr. Nixon went to law school at Duke University, so there was a lot of commerce and uh, visiting office to office in those days. And, uh, Don Helms and I uh, became very much impressed with the Nixon family. You know, the Nixon's two daughters were about the same age as I was two daughters. So I liked the man and I uh, didn't always agree with him. But uh, had it not been for the unfortunate episode, as Sam Irvin once put it, to me. He said if Nixon had just burned those tapes, uh, he was going down as one of the great presidents in history. And, uh, historians may yet uh, accord him that, because that remains to be seen. Long answer to your question. Sorry about that. Senator, you've got a chance to uh, uh, view your uh, the new senator. What's your feelings about that? Well, uh, 
Imagine yourself, uh, we all love our hometowns and our home counties, right? We all feel that uh, we came from the best place on earth. And I feel that way about Monroe and Union County. And uh, my hope had been uh, all along somehow to uh, not bring shame to Monroe and Union County. But this uh, center, as I have seen it this afternoon with uh, the grounds in good shape and the house restored and partially furnished with the, the uh, items that uh, we think and hope that the public will enjoy. Uh, of course, I'm impressed and I'm deeply touched. Incidentally, I might add that uh, it was not my idea to have a Jesse Helm Center. I wish I could claim credit for it, but uh, I had nothing to do with that. The former president of, Duke, uh, of, of William College, Paul Courts, and the present president, Jerry McGee, they sort of worked out this deal of having a Jesse Helm Center, and I hope it will serve a useful purpose to uh, encourage people to think about the meaning of the miracle of America. Once we get back to the understanding and realization that this country didn't just happen, that it was created by our founding fathers who were guided by providence to whom the founding fathers prayed at the time for guidance. And that's the fundamental strength of this country, the moral precepts and the spiritual concepts and all the rest of it. And uh, when we get back to that, we can begin to solve some problems, but we're not going to be able to solve the crime problem unless and until the American people make up their minds that we've been on the wrong track for a long time. We've been emphasizing a lot of things that don't matter in terms of success and growth and that sort of thing. So and I hope that this, this center will serve a purpose in that regard. You plan to pursue your fight with prayer in school? Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Kennedy had to use skull degree in order to defeat it this time but a great many senators, Democrats as well as Republicans, are indignant at the tactics he used to defeat the uh, prayer amendment, which after all was approved by the Senate three to one and the House of Representatives twice by about four to one. It was dropped in conference at Mr. Kennedy's prearrangement, and I think the American people resent it, and I think they resent the kind of tactics he utilized. I'm sorry. How, how the school has helped you in your career and why it's important to have this? Well, uh, you've got to start with the fact that I was a depression child. There was no money. Uh, my father, uh, being chief of police, made a, a only a nominal salary. And there was no money to go to school, and I had made application to, for jobs, uh, washing dishes at Wake Forest and State and Carolina, and uh, everybody was doing the same thing. So I was a little bit disconsolate, but there came the president of Wingate College and said, we want you to go to school at Wingate. And I said, I don't have the money. And he said, well, we'll take a chance on you, and maybe... Uh, uh, somewhere down the road you'll pay us back, which I did. So uh, I wanted to do something for the college that did something for me when I needed it. And we had a number of major universities, some in the Ivy League. We had Duke Carolina, East Carolina, Wake Forest, Sewanee, University of Tennessee, I think, uh, all were bidding for my papers because I'm so conservative, you know. And I just decided uh, on an impulse one day that, shucks, I owe something to this college that gave me a chance. And I offered them, and I remember Paul Court said, you've got to be kid kidding. He said, I don't know anything about the uh, housing papers like that. But I'll say yes, and then I'll go back and talk to my trustees, and uh, they will validate what, I, what I've just told you. And that's how it came about.
John? Can you tell us your observations on the Bosnia situation? Should the gladly, US gladly. First, the United States, unilaterally or otherwise, ought to take the flat out position that the arms embargo against Bosnia should be lifted. Now, all of these excuses and all of these uh, specious reasoning, reasons that uh, I hear, they just don't add up. When you look at and see what's happening to the Bosnians, talk about a level playing field. One out of every four soldiers of the Bosnians has, even has a gun. And only one out of two of those has any ammunition for it. Meanwhile, the Serbs, they, uh, they have everything. Now, I am not in favor of sending any American young man or young woman into that fight. It's been going on for years and years, and no matter what kind of agreement that is reached, it'll go on for years and years and years. But I am in favor of compassionate aid uh, to Bosnia. And uh, that means medicine and uh, any other thing, that we, food, anything that we could do of that nature. But I don't want to put one American uh, serviceman or woman in harm's way you, in that battle. Are you in favor of expanded air operations in Bosnia against the Serbs that may involve... Uh, Just so America? NATO does it and the United States is left out of it. I repeat, I do not want any American military personnel put in harm's way in that fight. One, one follow-up question. Sure. What's the difference in the Bosnia situation? You were in favor of intervening in the Persian Gulf. You were in favor of the U.S. going into Panama to arrest Noriega. Why not intervene in Bosnia? Well, we had a, 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 a great many nations, uh, uh, obviously at the behest of George Bush, who made calls and visits and so forth. But uh, the, the Europeans need to solve this problem if anybody's going to solve it, not the uh, U United States. We had a lot of interest, and uh, there were two countries, and, and we had made a terrible mistake with our support of Iraq early on. Uh, there was a senator from North Carolina, his name escaped me at the moment, who warned repeatedly about Saddam Hussein. And uh, we even had a U.S. ambassador uh, who just fell all over herself uh, loving up to the Saddam Hussein crowd. But uh, there's a vast difference in the two, and I, I think that uh, and there was an obvious end to the Persian Gulf War. There is no obvious end to the Serb-Bosnian situation. Steve, I've been with you about two hours today. I think on average we've prayed about every 15 minutes. <clears throat> it has to be different when you're speaking to it. During the final four week, the, the Business Journal wrote in an inter introduction to our region for thousands of visitors who filled our streets. Appropriately, that guide included the fact that Senator Jesse Helms is a native and that his library is in neighboring Wingate College. How appropriate and how exciting for the town and this college to have access to the research and study resources of an outstanding senator. We are honored by this opportunity. You know, but the, fa the Helms family has given Wingate College an even greater honor. They have trusted us with the education of Miss Jennifer Knox, the senator's granddaughter, and by the way, the newly elected secretary of our Student Government Association. Like all of the families who honor us in this way, Jennifer's family depends on us to live up to our promises, that is to provide a sound education within an ethical framework and to prepare every student for future leadership. Wingard offered this same promise to Jesse Helms family in the late 1930s, and he took full advantage of this opportunity. Jesse Helms 
learn to think clearly and speak honestly, to debate the issues and to stand on principle without losing sight of the human dimension of individual rights and the rewards of triumph over adversity. Jennifer and her fellow students will graduate into a very different world than her grandfather found. But they too will be ready to tackle the big issues, to stand against the crowd when right demands that they do so. They will have two advantages over their, counter, over their contemporaries, the experience of a winged education and the example of an outstanding senator. I present to you Senator Jesse Hammonds. I think you must know how meaningful it is that so many of you have come here this evening to welcome our distinguished speaker. You have a real treat in store for you. He was given a tremendous ovation today at lunch in Charlotte. And it goes without saying that uh, it's so meaningful to me that so many of you and others are interested in the center just down the road. Seldom does a day pass that somebody from North Carolina, this area, is not in our office in Washington. And some have brought pictures that they have taken of the center. And this tells me that uh, they are proud of that. And if that is the case, I'm even prouder that the facility is there. A steadily increasing number of people are stopping by the center and conveying complimentary assessments of the work that has been undertaken by and for the center, its precepts, its ideals, and its impressive facilities. I hope you agree that they are impressive. And incidentally, if you haven't visited the center, I hope you will. You will be welcome. Now, I wish I could take credit for the idea of creating that center, but I cannot. It belongs to Wingate's former president, Dr. Paul Kortz, and to Wingate's present president, the delightful and inimitable Dr. Jerry McGee, and many others. And speaking of Jerry, uh, Any time a man has a son who is being inducted into Phi Beta Kappa, he is entitled to be forgiven for not being anywhere else. As for me, all I did was offer Wingate College my official Senate papers, an offer that was promptly accepted. Now, you may be interested in a prelude to that decision on my part. You see, I am so controversial among some people. And the, uh, some of the liberal universities in North Carolina and outside of North Carolina, they began bidding for the papers. We even had uh, two from the Ivy League. And we had Sewanee and the University of Tennessee. We had Duke, Carolina, East Carolina, and so forth and so on. But I got to thinking, uh, I ought to give these papers to the little college that gave me a break back during the Depression. Some of you here uh, will remember those days. Uh, actually, I must confess that uh, I didn't know we were poor. Uh, everybody was in the same fix, but I did know that there was no money to, in my family to go to college. And the president of Wingate College came to our house and said, uh, we want you to come to Wingate. And I said, I don't have any money. And he said, well, we'll take a chance on you. And for that reason, because Wingate took a chance on me, I decided to shock 
the academic community in the Ivy League, and they're still muttering about it. And I offered my papers to, to Wendy, Dr. Court. When I mentioned it to Dr. Cork on one of his many visits to our office in Washington, he said, you've got to be kidding. He said, I, don't, I wouldn't know what to do with papers like that. I said, well, you'll learn. <laughs> and he said, well, I'm going to answer you right now, and then I'll go back and clear it with the trustees. And well, they did. So what you see materializing just down the road, and which I hope you will always Feel free to enjoy, and I hope that you will find it profitable for this marvelous area in the years to come. This idea was born of a perceived opportunity to help America, help America find its way back to the fundamental standards of decency and morality and personal responsibility. And these qualities have been diminished in our time. Someone asked me just the other day what I thought of the crime bill that the House of Representatives finished this week. I said, well, every, every year that I've been in the Senate, except one or two, the Congress has passed a crime bill. And each time, the politicians have gone home and said, boy, this is going to solve it. We're going to curb the crime and all the rest of it. Well, let me convey to you my opinion that no crime bill is going to work unless until the American people do what de Tocqueville said they were doing back in the middle of the 19th century. He said America had grown great because the American people were trying to be good. Now, they weren't perfect. Nobody suggests that they were. And Alex de Tocqueville further said that America will continue to be great as long as it continues to try to be good, but when it ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. And that's the warning that all of us confront, and it's a challenge to how we may feel about this country, which I think, and I know you agree, ought to be able to survive. So I reiterate that it was not my idea to have the center, let alone name it the Jesse Helm Center. But I confess that I'm honored that the decision was made. So since it does bear my name, and since there are so many forces pushing against efforts to restore the moral and spiritual principles in our land, I do hope that the center will forever push back with every ounce of energy that can be marshaled. I pray that you will let us join hands with you to try to do what we can to restore this blessed land to the high ethical, moral, and spiritual standards that once prevailed in the hearts of the American people. Which, of course, brings me to the remarkable American who graces us with his presence here this evening on the Wyndham College campus under the sponsorship of the Helm Center. Now, his formal name, of course, is Malcolm S. Forbes, Jr. But his friends, and that includes you, call him Steve. There's no limit to my admiration of this gentleman's talents or his character or his integrity or his tenacity or his dedication, which all together qualify for him, qualify him for any and I underscore any, any position of leadership in America today. And if you are assuming that I think Steve Forbes would make an excellent president of the United States, you're right on target. Steve Forbes is president and chief executive officer of Forbes Incorporated, and he's editor-in-chief of Forbes Magazine, which without question is America's foremost business magazine. He also heads another Forbes Corporation, which operates a chain of weekly newspapers, along with the American Heritage Magazine. Now, since 1990, 
When he took over the leadership of all of these publications, he has launched a number of new business publications along with German, Japanese, and Chinese editions of Forum magazine itself. And he writes editorials for every issue. He does a regular radio commentary, which is syndicated nationally. He somehow finds time to appear on a variety of national television and radio programs, McNeil Lara being one of them. And this man, as I said earlier today in Charlotte, is absolutely unflappable. He had been to my office many times, and he had enough on his mind to worry anybody else to death, but he just probes ahead. He paces himself, and he's always willing to lend a hand to a new or different cause that seeks to enhance the miracle of America. He's the only writer to have won the highly prestigious Crystal Owl Award four times. Now, this award is given to the financial journalist in America whose economic forecast for the coming year proved to be the most accurate. Now, I first met him, I think it was in 1985, when President Reagan named him chairman of the Bipartisan Board for International Broadcasting, which oversees the operations of Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty. Just to avoid having too much idle time on his hands, Steve Forbes, in addition to all of that, serves on Princeton University's Board of Trustees and on at least a dozen other foundations and boards which require a sacrificial dedication of his time. As I say, this fine American has been in my office on a number of occasions on behalf of Radio Free Europe and Radio Free Liberty. And as I mentioned in Charlotte earlier today, there was a time when uh, things didn't look all that well for Radio Free Europe and Radio Free Liberty, but uh, thanks to a meeting of the House of Representatives, of which I am the ranking member on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, uh, the thing was worked out, not perfectly, but uh, uh, these fine entities, broadcasting entities that do so much good will continue operation in an effective way. Steve Forbes knows that he can count on me to stand with him, and I reiterate that to him and to you tonight. He can count on me to stand with him because he always stands for freedom. Now, obviously, I like this guy, and I respect him, and I'm honored to, to present to you the distinguished Malcolm S. Forbes, Jr., Editor-in-Chief of Forbes Magazine. Steve, say hello to a bunch of nice folks. Thank you very much, Senator Helms, for that overly generous introduction. I, my only regret is that some of my kids didn't hear it. They, 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 they wouldn't believe it, but it would be nice if they could hear it. But I, as the senator indicated, I got to know him when I chaired the board that oversaw Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty back in 1985, right up through April of 1993. And when one is in the position like that, even though it's theoretically a part-time job, one does have to spend a lot of time visiting representatives and senators on Capitol Hill because the radios have a small budget by Washington standards, but for reasons that can only be understood, I think, by future historians, those radios did seem to arouse an outsized kind of opposition, whether it's from elements in the State Department or the Office of Management or Budget or some staffers on the Hill. And more than once, we were fighting for our very existence. This, even though these radios reached millions and still do reach millions of people in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union on a daily basis, essential for them getting information about what is happening inside their countries. They don't have reliable sources of information. 
That's crucial to getting the information through when there's communism. It's crucial if you want to ever have hope of getting democracy there. You cannot have democracy without information. And Senator Helms, when I went to him, my colleagues, to make our pitch for the radios, understood immediately their importance. He needed no long explanation. And moreover, unlike so many in public life, he not only immediately saw the need for them, but committed right there to do all he could to keep them going. In other words, he was willing to commit political capital right away, without any hedging, willing to fight for something that even though it what, ostensibly wasn't going to do anything for his region or for his state of North Carolina. That is very rare if you have to have to deal on the Hill, make pleas on the Hill, to have somebody of his stature, of his influence, willing to make that kind of a commitment, even though there was nothing ostensibly in it for him, is one example of, among many, of this man's unique courage. And it's not only courage, but that courage comes because he does have an inner compass, he does have a sense of direction, there is a substance inside, and he recognizes the importance of ideas. Ideas do influence how we see the world, ideas do influence how we behave, and he recognizes that if you fight for the right ideas, even if you get ridiculed and criticized, eventually, if the ideas are right, people will eventually see them, and you'll have an influence that will extend far beyond your own career and your own life and millions of people in the years ahead. I do think that when people look back on his career, they will always use, see the word controversial, and I think a lot of people in the future are going to scratch their heads and say, what in the world was the fuss all about? It seemed so basic. It seemed so commonsensical. So that is the essence of courage. A man who has an inner compass, the right kind of inner compass, does not always have his finger in the air seeing where the winds blow. Those of you who sail know that, yes, if you go where the winds blow, you will travel, but you won't get to your destination. And this is a man who has a firm sense of his destination, and I just want to share it with you what an extraordinary fellow he is. I've been privileged to work with him, and I hope all of you have had a chance to work with him as well. Thank you very much, Senator Helms. As I mentioned to the Senator at lunchtime today, he is also a gentleman, a very gracious individual, and a good proof of that is how gently he treated how I got to where I am in life. As you know, I head up a family publication. I have three brothers who are also in the business, and unlike you who are got ahead in life through hard work and sheer ability, or who are going to have to get ahead through hard work and sheer ability, my three brothers and I did it a little differently, perhaps a little easier, in the sense that we picked parents who already owned a successful business. Uh, you know, in the sense, we did come to the attention of top management at a fairly young age. And as, as my brother, as my father liked to say, my father liked to say, and my brothers and I like to say it as well, that there is nothing wrong with nepotism as long as you keep it within the family. And, However, in, in, in a family business, in a family business, you do have to be careful not to get on the wrong side of the largest shareholder. Now, publicly held companies are beginning, beginning to discover that as institutional shareholders put pressure on the boards and top managements, but it's always true of a family company. And my brothers and I got that lesson very early when we came into the company. In the early days, we used to tease our father, or we called it teasing, but he had another name for it, and we used to make subtle hints like, gee, Dad, you'd look awfully good with a gold watch. Or we'd suggest that he spend more time in sunnier climates and subtle hints like that. And one day, my father had had enough of this, and he brought my three brothers and I into his office. He told us a true story about a family publishing house out in Kansas or Oklahoma. The father out there owned several newspapers and other properties, and he brought his son into the business. And the son immediately suggested that the company put in a mandatory retirement age of 65. This was before age discrimination laws. And the son said, and the father said, gee, son, that's a wonderful idea. We'll do it for everybody but me. Now, there are advantages when you own more than 51% of the stock. <laughs> the, the father then proceeded to live through his 60s, 70s, 80s, and around when he was 97 years old, still running the company, he still had that 51%, he toddled into his son's office one day and said, son, you're 65 and you're out. <laughs> My, my brothers and I got the hint, 
and we embarked upon our version of a shareholder relationship improvement program. Uh, in other words, we made a real effort to see our father's point of view of things, and we managed to keep our jobs while that other son didn't get his job back till age 72. Uh, concerning the topic tonight of ethics and business, I've been asked to make a few remarks on it. I realize this is a Friday night, so I'll try not to speak too long. But in one sense, if you think about ethics, in one sense it does mean obeying the law, it does mean not cheating, and if you're in business it means not engaging in restraint of trade. And these are kind of values that you learn as a youngster, right and wrong, and if you haven't gotten, begin to get a sense of it by the time you're in kindergarten, you're going to have some trouble in life. So in that sense, ethics and business you can deal with them just in a few senses, in a few sentences. But in a deeper sense, ethics and values are at the base of our economic system, and this is something that too many economists, too many business writers overlook, and perhaps business as well. The essence, as you know from your own study of history, the essence of the American experiment, what makes this country unique in the world, different from any other, is that it allows individuals the opportunity to discover, and I say opportunity, doesn't to guarantee, but the opportunity to discover and develop their God-given talents, to develop them fully and constructively. It means that seemingly common people can do uncommonly great things if individuals are allowed and encouraged take responsibility for themselves, their families, and their communities. Our economic system, you can call it democratic capitalism. It's not managed capitalism, it's not fascist capitalism or state capitalism, whether the Nazi variety or the fascist variety or the communist variety. But contrary to what some people think about our economic system, it is not based on greed, it is not based on selfishness, but truly is, if you think about it, a moral system. It encourages individuals to freely devote, and I emphasize freely devote, their talents and impulses to peaceful pursuits. We all know human nature. We know that we have good impulses and that too many of us have less good impulses and on some individuals evil impulses. But these impulses in this kind of free society are directed to peaceful purposes to satisfying other people's needs and wants. That is the essence of capitalism. It's based not on greed. Misers don't create Microsofts and Walmarts. Think about it. The system enables millions of people, seemingly ordinary people who don't know each other and may never meet each other, to work cooperatively with each other without direction from above in an incredible and complex series of transactions each and every day. Think of a restaurant. You have a restaurant. You need electricity. Somebody brings a line in for electricity. If it's a coal-powered plant, the plant needs coal, you'll never meet the coal miners. You'll never meet the trains that bring the coal in. You'll never meet the workers probably working the plant, who built the plant and operate the plant. But thousands of people are involved just running that line to your restaurant. The food, the trucks that bring the food come off assembly lines. Again, thousands of people you'll never meet, who again are working with tens of thousands of others who provide them with the raw materials. The food comes from various farms, whether they grow wheat, corn, cows, pigs, chickens, whatever, again, involving scores of people, hundreds of people, even thousands of people that you'll never meet. And yet each of you in this effort work cooperatively, not in a collective and a communist sense, but through voluntary activities each and every day. There's an element of trust in capitalism that also gets overlooked. You turn on the light, you, you expect the light to go on when you turn on the switch. You go to a service station and you expect fuel there. When you come to a traffic light, unless you think no one's looking, it's late at night, if it's red, you're going to stop. And if it's green, you're going to go. You trust that others will do the same thing. Too much emphasis is put on self-interest. Yes, people do want to get ahead, and that's the right thing to do. Letting you, if you have a talent or a knack for something, not developing that talent is a waste and is wrong. But it's not what some people call greed. There's more than selfishness involved. They miss the point that in a free society, ask yourself, how does a business succeed? By offering products and services that others will freely buy. You're not forcing somebody to take what you're offering. And if you make an offering of a product or a service and people don't buy it, you fail unless you have the power of the state behind you. In short, if you don't offer what people are willing to buy or can't persuade them, you don't succeed. So to succeed, 
You have to think about this and remind others of this, but to succeed, you must satisfy and serve other people. Even if you're a hard-headed business person, even if you like to crush people down like they do in soap operas in the movies, all the villains and you smoke cigars and blow smoke in people's faces and all that sort of thing, you may be all those bad things, but if you want to succeed in business and you don't have the power of the state behind you, you must be offering something that you must be offering something that others are willing to buy. In other words, to be successful, you have to satisfy others. So instead of plundering and looting your neighbor, as they did in days of old, you end up directing those energies to serve others in ways that we don't even think about it on a day-to-day -day basis. Of course, there is a deeper moral foundation. It's based not just on the servicing others, but based on a strong sense of right and wrong of the Judeo-Christian tradition. After all, child pornography is a service. It can be a business, but it's not something that good people will sanction or tolerate. So there's a foundation. Capitalism is a foundation based on working with one another cooperatively, day-to-day -day basis, but it also must be based on a strong sense of values or the system ultimately is going to fail. This foundation, if it's proper moral foundation, ends up enriching people's lives in a way that would have been unfathomable just a few centuries ago. Competition sometimes is seen as a negative, sometimes seen as immoral, as business compete with one another and try to be more efficient, but again, it's part of this moral order because it enables people to have choices, to be able to get things and services that they otherwise would not get. Take, for example, telephones. For years, the telephone, the telephone industry in this company was dominated by AT&T. It was called in those days a natural monopoly. We did have the best phone service in the world. AT&T did make service their top priority. Unlike other monopolies, they really defied the rules of monopolistic gravity, you might say. But several years ago, a number of years ago, fiber optics were invented, glass wire, which was infinitely more efficient than copper wire. But AT&T decided they had so much invested in copper wire that they wouldn't go to fiber, or they'd only go gradually into fiber over a 30 or 40 year period. But then along came MCI, raised some money, a couple of billion through junk bonds, and decided to bet the company's very existence on going whole hog and long distance service via fiber optics. And Sprint, another company, did the same thing. Suddenly, to compete, to stay alive, AT&T had to do the same. So you had a good company that seemingly made a sound economic decision, but was forced by competition to do things more efficiently, and the you, the consumer, came out ahead. Or look at Walmart. How is Walmart able to overtake two great giants like Sears and Kmart in retailing? One of the oldest businesses around is retailing. It wasn't so much that Sam Walton rode around in a pickup truck and visited the stores, or that he put stores in towns where the competition wasn't. It was, again, the basis that he used very sophisticated technology, inventory technology, so they keep track of all their products on a day-to-day -day basis. Much more important, much more important, they had a management system. They had a management system that forced to respond to that information on a daily and weekly basis. So they knew what was happening in the field, and they forced themselves to respond to it to meet the needs of their customers. By contrast, with a company like Sears until a couple of years ago, when they finally got their act together, the information would come in from the field to Chicago, first floor on their tower, take a few weeks to make the trek up 80 or 90 floors, to someone or an office where a decision might be made. So whereas Walmart could respond to people's needs within days or hours, Sears took weeks or months. And so a company that was very small became, over a period of time, with the service to the customer, became the largest retailing entity in the United States against formidable opposition. Or look at our automobile industry. Thirty years ago, our executives in the auto industry, management in the auto industry, whether they knew it or not, began to accept the premise of some political scientists and professors who said that this was a mature industry, that the automobile industry was the epitome of an industrial society and there was no way you could improve it or make it better, that it was impervious to market forces, didn't have to respond to shareholders. You should read some of this stuff. If you want to uh, read a book called The Industrial State by John Kenneth Galbraith to get this kind of thinking, which once passed for thinking in academic circles and other circles. And so the automobile industry thought that they there was no way people could compete with them. It took blobs of capital to compete in automobiles. It 
took a massive network of distribution systems, and so they thought that this was it. They had reached the height. Unfortunately for them, and fortunately for the customer, Japan didn't read books by John Kenneth Galbraith, and therefore they didn't know that there was no point in trying to compete against the American automobile industry. Moreover, unlike other companies in Japan, this auto industry was a little different in that it ignored government decrees to go out of business and emerge and unite together. And so even though the Japanese companies in the late 50s and early 60s did not do very well when they first came to this country, they kept at it, they kept at it, and as a result, we all know what happened. Detroit was sent reeling to the wall. But Detroit is a competitive business when they realize that they face competition, when customers did want better technology and better products and better services, and so complacency gave away to a comeback. And the comeback was led by Chrysler and Ford because they didn't have much in the way of financial resources. Now General Motors is getting its act together. And a comeback, people are beginning to realize that now Americans can make cars just as good as the foreigners can. So the consumer came out ahead. Tough times for the auto industry, tough times in competition. But you, the consumer, the consumer came out ahead. And today, just to show how much things have changed, today, Chrysler alone makes more money than all of the Japanese auto manufacturers put together. So competition does work. In short, the kind of system we have in this country, we've had in this country, can't be a top-down system because the government doesn't know best. For example, today, we have in Washington a labor secretary, a man named Robert Reich, who does believe that the government has the power to pick winners and losers and therefore should have the power make investments in companies and direct who are going to be the sunshine industries and who will be the sunset industries. Well, if he is so good at seeing the future, why doesn't he go into the investment business himself? Why doesn't he come to you and say, I can see the future. Give me your money and I shall invest it for you. Instead, he and others like him, industrial planners like him, have to rely on the coercive power of the state to take your money and invest it for you. But the real essence of people with wealth is not the fact they, they don't have piles of gold or piles of jewels. It's their investment prowess that makes them what they are. And they can risk their capital and do it far better than a bureaucracy can because it's their capital, their responsibility, and they're held accountable if they don't succeed. So the Robert Reiches can't succeed. No matter how smart government is, there's no way even a powerful computer can replicate the literally hundreds of millions of transactions whether it's with that restaurant or anything else that go on each day that we take for granted. Millions and millions of voluntary transactions. Also, it involves millions of people. A successful economy involves millions of people taking chances. Hundreds of thousands of entrepreneurs starting businesses. Most businesses don't succeed. Most new businesses fail. Even businesses that have a long success, major companies have a long success, often end up in the corporate graveyard because they get seduced by their success into thinking that they know all about their business. And oftentimes an outsider comes in with an innovation, a new process, a new product, and turns the industry upside down. There's no way a computer can replicate the millions of people taking chances with their own imagination, their own money, their relatives' money, investment capital money. There's no way a government can replicate that. And why replicate it when millions are willing to do it voluntarily? Just look, for example, at IBM. IBM was once held up as the epitome of American industrial power, it was seen mainframes would dominate the world forever. And actually, the French government, the French government once thought in the 1960s that all computing would be done by a handful of mainframes and so they gave terminals to a lot of people in France, hundreds of thousands of people in France. It was a government program based on the future of computing industry being all mainframe oriented. Well, a couple of youngsters, including a college dropout, a couple of college dropouts, came up with the notion of what we now know as the personal computer, Apple computer, which turned the whole industry upside down. Now, if a couple of long-haired youngsters, who by my standards are youngsters now, but some of them are your age, uh, can come up with an idea, raise the capital, and actually make IBM into a company today that has now had to struggle for its own survival. 
That is trouble for IBM, but it's an opportunity for all of us because it, in effect, advances technology in a way that few would have thought possible. Or look at Japan. Japan believes in a top-down approach. But Japan has been a failure in software because that relies on human creativity. And so now they've had to acknowledge that failure, and they're spending now a lot of money trying to buy our software, find out how we do it, and try to catch up. As a matter of fact, today, in new computing software, new computing software, you know which country is number two in the world? The U.S. is number one by two to one margin. But you know what country is number two now, new software creation? It's not Germany. It's not Japan. It's not a specific a Pacific Rim country. It is India. So that's an example of a globalization of the economy today. The age that we're entering into, this new information age, we can't foresee what lies ahead. We know that great things are going to happen, but we can't foresee it because of the limits of our own imagination. And this is the essence of capitalism. You make an offering, a new product or a new service, but you have no idea of how people are going to use it. They may use it in ways that you didn't imagine, didn't intend. It's like a parent with a child. The child grows up with its own personality. You may have created the child, but the child grows up an adult and has its very own personality. The same thing is true in business. Look, for example, at the creation of the telephone, the invention of the telephone by Alexander Graham Bell in 1876. When that invention was made, a noted Englishman made this observation. He said, the telephone will succeed in the United States, but will fail in England. He said, the United States is a continental nation, underpopulated, which it was at the time, and he said, Therefore, the United States suffers from a shortage of messenger boys. By contrast, he said, England suffers no shortage of messenger boys, and because it's a very compact country, heavily populated, there's no need for a telephone to transfer messages from one party to another. Messenger boys can do it very well. You don't have to have a lot of wires, just some bicycles and messenger boys, and so you don't need the telephone in England. Or take radio. When people realized you could send signals through the air, we think of radio with voice. But initially, radio was conceived of as wireless telegraph. So we can't know what the future is. Even if you're an inventor, people are going to end up using things in ways that you could not have imagined. So economics is not so much mathematics. Mathematics are simply like a photograph, a picture of an instant. But it's, the economy should be thought of as a movie, as a moving dynamic. It's not math but it is based on morality. For example, when people talk about market forces, you've heard the phrase market forces, impersonal market forces, what critics call it, as if some alien called market force came out of space. What are impersonal market forces? They are you, the people, making decisions each and every day about what you buy and what you don't buy. You are the impersonal market forces by what you do. It's like calling democracy impersonal democratic forces. When people use the phrase impersonal market forces, it means that you're doing things that they don't think they want you to do. You're doing it without their permission, and they don't like that. Think of it, too, this way, in terms of morality. We hear a lot about money. And money is a lot of numbers. Money supply, variables between one M and another M. It sounds all very confusing. But money is simply a means to enable people to do business with one another without going through barter. And there's a moral aspect here as well. When we, for example, had the gold standard, money had a constant value. And if you want to have a real four-letter word in economics, just use the word G-O-L-D. They go berserk. But stable money, whether you use it through gold or some other method, stable money has a moral foundation. And it is this. When somebody is paid for his or her labor, if it's $5 or $10 or $20, that $10 or $20 should remain constant. It shouldn't change in value because of manipulation by the government, which has been going on since the 1930s. People in Washington and other central banks feel that they can help the economy by manipulating money. But it is wrong. Money is simply a measure, a yardstick, like a ruler. One foot is supposed to be 12 inches, right? But imagine what would happen if the ruler changed each day in its measurements. Imagine how inefficient that would be if it was 9 inches one day, 18 inches another, 15 inches the following day. It would be very hard to build things. And it's also immoral in the sense that it can cheat people 
and unfairly help people. Think of building a house, say 2,000 square feet, you make a deal with the carpenter contractor to build a house. Feet is 12, 12 inches to the, to the ruler, 12 inches to the foot. Imagine the government decrees in Washington that they manipulate the ruler to go from 12 inches to 14 inches. Well, you, the home buyer, gets an advantage. You get a 17% bigger house because that 2,000 square feet is not based on a 12-inch foot, but on a 14-inch foot. So you come out with a de good deal. But the carpenter, the contractor, is cheated. By contrast, if the ruler went from 12 inches to 10 inches, you suddenly have a much more smaller house than you bargained for. The carpenter and the contractor come out ahead, but you're cheated. So in short, two people who make a deal, make a business deal with one another, suddenly one comes out ahead with a windfall gain, another comes out with a windfall loss. You put that on an economy as a whole, and it undermines the moral order. That's why inflation is always followed by more crime, because people get a sense that there is not justice out there, and we pay for it not just in an economic sense, but in a social and moral sense as well. It also applies to another mundane area, taxes. Just remember about taxes, taxes are not just merely a means of collecting revenue, taxes are also a price. A tax on income, a tax on profit, a tax on capital gains is the price you pay for the privilege of working, the price you pay for being innovative and successful. If the price of those things is too high, you get less of them. If the price is lower, you get more of them. If that seemingly basic insight seems to be lost by too many economists and policymakers in our states and in our municipalities and on the federal level. Just, just, just remember this, just remember this. A good economy should provide jobs, even if you lose jobs because of changes in one industry, there ought to be opportunity for you in other industries or other companies. Between 1982 and 1986, this country created 18 and a half million new jobs, including a record number of high paid jobs. Out of those 18 and a half million new jobs, 14 million, 14 million came from new businesses. In the late 80s, the capital gains tax was substantially raised. George Bush lost his effort to lower it. The capital gains tax was substantially raised. New business and corporations fell down, and we still haven't reached the level we did in new businesses that we did in the mid-1980s. The reason is understandable by anyone except perhaps a well-trained economist. And that is when you have a high when you have a high capital gains tax, it acts as a barrier to money flowing from old investments to new investments because you have to take such a hit to move the money from one investment to another new and riskier investment, it stands in the way of new business creation, stands in the way of innovation and job creation. Look at, for example, another area that we hear or read a lot about has a moral dimension, health care. It's not that simply we should take care of those who are sick. But ask yourself a very basic question. Why is it that things that are considered good in other parts of our lives are considered a crisis in health care? Why is it that demand for health is a crisis? How many of you heard that 14% of the economy goes for health care? It's going up, it must be curbed, or else we're all going to go broke. Do you hear about a crisis in automobiles when auto sales go up, or a crisis when people want more housing? That's considered a good for the economy. Why is it considered a crisis in health care? Or technology, normally considered a good thing, makes people more productive. Technology is considered a good in most parts of our lives. But in health care, it's considered by some health care experts a disaster because it means the hospitals will want to buy all that new fancy equipment. It's very expensive. It means prices are going to go up. And so they don't want you to get that better diagnostic equipment, it seems. Or take longevity. Take longevity. Most of us are in favor of living longer, particularly ourselves. We like the idea that we can live longer, that our families can live longer. Yet, you've, how many of you read about the health care crisis as described by Washington and read how much money is spent on the last six months of your life? As if it's a disaster that, you know, as if you could get a notice in the mail saying you have only six months to live, stop going to the doctor because it's, it's a waste of money. You know, as if as if being old is somehow a crime. You know, you demand more health care. Therefore, if we didn't have old people, we wouldn't have a health care crisis. It's crazy. Why are things like demand, technology, and longevity that we think of as positives in health care is considered a crisis? The answer is because of a quirk in the tax code to 
is think of it this way. An employer gets to pay for insurance premiums, health insurance premiums with pre-tax dollars. If you, an individual, try to buy health insurance, you have to do it with after-tax dollars. And if you're self-employed, only 25 cents on the dollar is deductible. So if you have a tax code distortion where one party can buy insurance at a substantially lower price than another, it's no surprise that employers buy most health insurance. But what this does, what this does, is that it disguises and hides from people who truly pays for health care. We all pay for it, but we somehow seem to think that somebody else is paying for it. And so as a result, there's none of the discipline in health care that we get elsewhere. People think that somebody else is paying for it. Just imagine what would happen to your auto. If you think auto insurance is expensive, what would happen to the price of your auto insurance if every time you got gasoline, every time you checked the car, every time you changed the tires, you got a reimbursement from the insurance company? Would you care if a gallon of gasoline cost $1 or $10 if somebody else was paying for it? Or what would happen to the price of automobiles if the government paid for your automobile? Whether you bought a $5,000 car or $50,000 car, if the government paid for it, you wouldn't care what kind of car you bought. You'd take whatever you could lay your hands on. And then we'd have an automobile shortage, and the Clintons would say, we guarantee every American an automobile. And we'd have an auto, automobile crisis. <laughs> we, did, we, did, we did an experiment. We did an experiment at Forbes magazine three years ago, and we were faced with these higher costs. We offered our people, we kept the same benefits. We weren't going to cut back on benefits, but we offered our people a bonus. We wanted them to feel about health care costs the way management felt about it. We wanted them not to just have sticks in the higher way of higher deductibles and co-pays. We also wanted them to have a positive incentive to treat health care dollars the way they do their dollars for every other aspect of their lives. So we offered our people a bonus to pay them, pay them a bonus, of the difference between what they filed in medical claims, not what they spent with the doctor, but what they filed with the insurance company, and $500, and then we double it. In short, if in a calendar year, 1992 this started, if you filed no medical claims, you would get from us $500 times two, $1,000 at the end of the year, tax-free. We'd gross it up and pay the tax. So what's happened to people's minds? Suddenly they realized that each dollar they spent or filed for a reimbursement was suddenly two dollars out of their pocket. It suddenly wasn't my money or the government's money or the insurance company's money or somebody else's money. Suddenly it was their money. So what did they do? What do you expect normal people to do? Comparison shop. Drug stores don't always charge the same price for prescriptions. Sometimes a generic can be infinitely cheaper than a regular prescription and just be as effective. A company out in Indiana, called Golden Rule Insurance Company, had a similar program, they call it medical savings accounts. You get fifteen hundred to two thousand at the beginning of the year to spend on medical care, and what you didn't spend on medical care, what you didn't spend on medical care, you got to keep in the savings account. So you didn't you didn't use it, you didn't lose it. So great incentive to watch medical costs. And the secretary out there, divorced, had one child, testified about the effect on her. She had trouble with the teeth in her mouth, the molars three teeth in bad shape, went to the dentist, said $500 to fix the whole thing up per tooth, $1,500. She said, my God, that's too much. It's my money. So she went to another dentist and another dentist. One said, I can do it for $425 per tooth. Then she went to finally another one after talking to some friends, and he said, you're not going to win a beauty contest with this procedure, but I can do some fillings and do a few other things in the back. Uh, as long as no one takes a picture of it, no one's going to know that it won't win a beauty contest. But she didn't care because it was $90 per tooth. Now, put yourself in her shoes. Would you have made that kind of effort to fix your teeth, $90 versus $500, if it wasn't your money? Of course not. So if you give 100 million consumers the power to police this market, they will do it just as well as they do in other free markets. When individuals have control of their resources, they treat them much better and much more efficiently. So in health care, the answers are not don't take a rocket scientist. They don't take 500 people meeting in secret to come up with an elaborate new nationalized socialized system. You don't have to go that route. All you have to do, all you have to do is treat people equally on taxes. Let individuals have equal tax treatment with corporations. Let them set up medical savings account that can be financed either by themselves or by their employer. 
And if they don't use the money for routine care, they get to keep it. They can have catastrophic coverage, which is much cheaper than dollar-for-dollar -dollar coverage. And you combine that with a handful of sensible other reforms, such as allowing portability so that if you lose your job or change jobs, you can take the policy with you so you don't have to be uninsured. Have a rule that they can't take the policy away from you. As you know, if you buy life insurance, if you buy life insurance, after a period of time, the company cannot take that policy away from you as long as you pay the premiums. But in health insurance, too often, if you start to use it, if you have a disease or something, they, yank, they won't renew it at the end of the year. That's not insurance. What's the point of having insurance if you can't use it? It's like if you have homeowner's insurance, a storm hits your house and the insurance company says, sorry, we're not going to cover that. I mean, what's the point of it? So just a few rules like portability, can't take it away, high-risk pools for those with pre-existing conditions. This is nothing new. We've done it in other aspects of insurance. And those who are truly poor and can't afford insurance or have been unemployed for too long or don't have the assets, you can have vouchers, you can have health stamps. Sure, it's going to cost some money, but as long as they get to buy the policy, as long as individuals have the choice, then that will be a much more efficient way than having a nationalized bureaucratic system run out of Washington. That way we don't have to ruin research and development in this country. Everyone can be covered, everyone can have insurance, and we can have the kind of free market system that works elsewhere. The reason that I've emphasized this, going into such detail in health and other areas, is the importance of keeping free market principles in mind and the basic morality in mind. On the health care debate, the President and his wife have tried to occupy the high ground by saying, we're concerned about people, we're worried that they don't have health care. But the real morality is letting individuals be empowered to direct their health care dollars, help those who need the help, but allow those who can want to make their own choices, want to make their own decisions, make their own decisions. Just think about it for a moment. We are a democracy. We are allowed to choose our own leaders. We can choose our own spouse. We try to choose our own careers or where we live. We have all of these choices. Yet in health care, supposedly, we're too dumb to make the choices. It has to be done from above. So keep that in mind in health care and in other areas. In short, it is true what the Bible said, man cannot live by bread alone. And fortunately, in this country, we're recognizing that again. In closing, we've known that even though we've made enormous material advances in the last few decades, we've also seen something happen to the quality of life in this country. It has gotten worse. The most dramatic example, of course, is a poll taken among school teachers 50 years ago and a poll taken more recently. 50 years ago, surprisingly enough, among these surveys of school teachers, the big, one of the biggest problems that school teachers faced, they said 50 years ago, was chewing gum. It was on the seats, it was under the desks, it was on the floor. Other problems were spitballs, talking out of turn, unruliness in lines, truancy, it sounds almost like Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn, because we know what's happened since then. What did the survey show today? Substance abuse, drug abuse, teenage pregnancy, shootings, rapes, robberies in the schools. And this is schools. This is not streets. Something has gone dreadfully wrong. We know the statistics about crime, where for this country's existence, violent crime had been on a downward trend right up to the 1960s, and then suddenly broke with the historic trend and shot up to the point where violent crime is now six times higher than it was 30 years ago. Well, fortunately, in a democracy like this, people do wake up to when there are problems, and people are starting to say, we're not going to tolerate it any longer, and we're going to start to get reform movements in this country. You can see the signs of it already. The New York Times had a story a couple of months ago about professional, middle-class, upwardly mobile people, professionals, starting to take their children to church or to temple even though they never would have thought they would have done it five years ago. Bill Bennett's book, called The Book of Virtues, sold over a million copies and still one of the top books on the bestseller list. Other books on the bestseller list talk about death, life, spirituality. People are suddenly interested in the subject again because they realize that something has gone wrong in this country. You see it on crime. People are starting not to tolerate crime anymore and consider measures they wouldn't have considered a few years ago. You see it in welfare reform. It's not the money that's spent on welfare that's so wrong. It's the way that it destroys people's lives, prevents them from developing their God-given talents, discovering them and developing them. So you are getting fundamental reforms. You're seeing it in Wisconsin. You're about to see it in Massachusetts. Real reforms that, if a Republican had proposed it a few years ago, would have been branded as utterly heartless. 
and yet two of the most liberal states in the Union, Wisconsin and Massachusetts, are in the forefront of reform. If you get that kind of reform from Massachusetts or Wisconsin, you know something is happening. You know something good is happening. So we are on the verge of a new era, not only in technology with the microchip, which is extending the reach of the human brain, as I mentioned earlier, the way machines extended the reach of human muscle in the last century. We are on the verge of a new information age. We're also discovering things that we should have learned or thought we'd once known 30, 40, or 50 years ago. So while there are a lot of problems with the country today, there are signs that things are going to change. It's not the first time we've gone off the track and had reform movements. We had back in the 1830s, hard to believe today, but in the 1820s, in the 1820s, per capita consumption of liquor in this country was five times what it is today. They called it cider in those days. But that cider, <laughs> that, that, that cider, that cider wasn't the stuff, kind of stuff that you bought at the supermarket for Halloween or for a drink on a hot afternoon. This was real hard stuff. And everyone did it. Kids did it. Parents did it. Instead of a tea or coffee break, you'd take a swig. And so not surprisingly, violence was endemic, especially in the home. And so there grew up a movement that said, in a democracy, you must have personal self-discipline. The temperance movement was the first public health movement in this country. It began in the 1830s. And despite the lack of sophisticated communications, within a period of 10 years, per capita consumption of alcohol fell in half in this country. So we've done it before, and we're about to do it again in ways that people could not have imagined. And also, people are beginning to discover that even though change can mean disruptions in our lives, that if we welcome change, positive change, and see it as a vehicle for developing our own talents, it is not something to be feared, but something to be tolerated and even embraced, not just for ourselves, but for our children. If you go back to the 1890s and read what thoughtful people said about the United States, you'd think they're writing about the U.S. today. The language was a little different, a little quainter, a little cleaner, but the message was the same, that America was going to hell in a handbasket. They looked at the frontier, which the 1890 census said had closed. The big chapter in America was at an end. There was a massive rise of big cities and big city slums. Instead of town meetings, you had big political corrupt machines. You saw the rise of monopolies instead of small businesses. You had immigration. One half of the country was either immigrant, 48% was either immigrant or children of immigrants. And people were wondering, can we absorb all of these people from southern and eastern Europe? Well, then along came the progressive movement symbolized by Teddy Roosevelt. We realized that we could make changes, that we could turn these changes into a positive force instead of something that is fearful and disrupts our lives. The same thing is happening today, and this is very important. This is very important because in the post-Cold War world, it's very important that the United States show that a democracy can work, that a democracy can bring about reform, that you don't need violent movements to make substantial changes, even if it means some disruptions in people's lives. Around the world, in the post-Cold War world, as you know from history, every war is followed by enormous changes in countries. Because think about it, during a war, whether it's a hot war or a cold war, you end up tolerating things you won't tolerate in peacetime. You'll tolerate things when you face an external threat that you find intolerable when you can concentrate on things at home. Look around the world at the political earthquakes. Italy, the traditional parties wiped away. Canada, the dominant party, the Conservatives, go from 155 seats to two seats a few months ago. The Liberal Democratic Party in Japan, the dominant party, is fractured. France, the dominating party, was decimated in last summer's elections. You see it in this country, the Perot movement, not so much for Ross Perot, but people saying, we don't like what's happening and we're going to protest it in the only way we know how. So there is enormous change, potential change out there, and if the United States can show that you can make change without violence, that you can make change, you know, substantial change, whether it's social policy or economic policy, then we'll once again be a beacon to the rest of the world. And that is the ultimate foreign policy, showing how others, by doing it ourselves, we can show others how to do it in a nonviolent way, that democracies can work. So, but all of this good that it can potentially happen in this economy won't happen if we make mistakes on the tax code, if we make mistakes on regulations, such as the FCC is now doing in communications, about to wreck our lead there, if we don't make the changes in the quality of life that we know have to be made, the government can't make good things happen. We can make it happen. 
I'm confident that with people like you, we have once again done what our parents and grandparents have done, what generations have done in the past, and made the American experiment not only work, but get a new revival of life and be an inspiration to the rest of the world. Thank you very much. It has been my distinct pleasure to hear these two gentlemen three times today, and it has made for a delightful day. Thank you both. And we will conclude our lecture series tonight with our benediction by Mr. Michael Howell. Please stand together as we pray. Dear Lord, we thank you that we live in a country with many freedoms. But help us not to forget that with that freedom comes responsibility. We thank you for the challenge that we have heard tonight to do good and be honorable in all of our transactions. Lord, help us to see that ethics is not just what we do or don't do, but it has to do with who we are. Guide us so that ethics and honor become a part of our very character. As we go out from this place, Give us the strength to deal ethically and justly with those we encounter each day. We thank you that your life on earth continues to be an example for each of us to follow. Lord, make us aware of your presence each day. And may this awareness bring us grace and peace. We pray in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen.